Well, good morning, everybody. You're listening to the No Nonsense Roundtable. My name is Dom Genova. I am the host here every Saturday from 10 to 11 on News Radio Wham 1180. And today I have an extra special show for you because I have uh, an individual who is, uh, well, nationally known. He's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He is also, of course, in the Rochester Music Hall of Fame. And uh, before I announce his name, I'll say uh, he is here in my studio with uh, a best bud that he's known since high school, and uh, his name is uh, Pat Prietti. And uh, the person that we're talking about, who is the main guest, is a fellow by the name of Gene Cornish. Say, hi, Gene. How you doing? Good. Hello, Rochester. Hello, Dom. Hello, Pat. Good to be here. Well, I what, what I want to do is educate people about uh, not only your your time in Rochester, Gene, and uh, the success that you've had, but also uh, a little bit about the Rascals, because my personal feeling about the Rascals is that the Rascals wove their way into American culture with their music. And I'm going to play that music now. The, I, I think the, the, the four most popular songs, and we're going to let people hear this, because I think that people know the music, but they may not necessarily know it's the Rascals, especially younger people. So we're, we're going to take a, a a minute or two to uh, to play these songs. On a Sunday afternoon So the songs you just heard was uh, probably the most uh, popular song was uh, Groovin. It's a beautiful morning. People got to be free. And the last one is Good Lovin', which just happens to be the name of Gene's book. <laughs> and the book's been selling really well, hasn't it, hasn't it, Gene? Yeah, we've been very happy. book came out two and a half years ago, and we sell books every day on Amazon. Of the th- two and a half years, only three days, three single days, it did not sell. So we're very happy. We're over 5,000 copies. Ah, uh, God bless you. That's great. And and, and, and Pat's here because Pat, Pat's like uh, one of your best buds. Now, you, um, the story is that um, you were born in Canada, but you moved here uh, when you were four years old. And then uh, the two you met when you were in high school and started playing together. Tell me about that story. Gene spent uh, his uh, entire life uh, other than that in Rochester until you moved to, uh, where'd you move from from uh, Rochester to where, Gene? I mean, where are you now? To New, York, to New York City, where I am now, 50 years ago, 55 years ago. Uh, but you consider yourself a Rochester guy, I think. Right? I consider myself a Rochester guy. <laughs> uh, that's my hometown, even though I wasn't born there, I was raised there. I learned my craft there. Pat and I learned our craft together. I do not play Rochester unless I play with Pat. Ah, and and if you want to know uh, how much of a Rochester guy uh, Gene is, if you look at his Wikipedia page, he's wearing a Red Wings baseball hat, and uh, you you grew up uh, within earshot of uh, the old Silver Stadium, right? I grew up a block away from Red Wings Stadium. When I was there, it was Red Wings Stadium. Then Maury Silver took it over. He saved. Rochester, he saved the Red Wings, and thank you to him. Yeah, a, a, a finer person never walked the face of the earth than uh, Maurice Silver, just a, a, a wonderful human being. So uh, so between the two of you, tell me about the old days. I mean, uh, the, the getting together and playing in Rochester. Let's bring back some memories from people from uh, from our age that remembered that, uh, that time. Uh, Pat, why don't you tell them a couple of quick stories, and I'll add to it. 
We started out, we had the opportunity to work for uh, Tony DeLuca, who booked Dances at Sherlock. And we had the opportunity to play with uh, some big name groups. We played with the Skyliners. Uh, our affiliation with Bud Paxton was uh, uh, our introduction to the Tokens. And they had just released The Lion Sleeps Tonight, so they disappeared on us. But uh, we played the clubs around Rochester. We played the 414 Club, and then we did a long, long stint at uh, the Niagara Grill. It was just about every weekend for a couple of years. And Gene can tell you some stories about the Niagara Grill. That was quite a place. Well, John Palomini owned the Niagara Grill on Niagara Street in Canandaigua. And... Uh, the bandstand was above the bar. I'll never forget it. And Pat will verify this. And John Palomini, there used to be a lot of fights because there used to be a lot of farm guys and construction workers. I don't remember too many women in this bar. Uh, but he would say, whenever there's a fight, turn up the guitars. <laughs> Just drown out everything with the guitar. So now you played in the same group, or was it what you guys uh, hung out with other groups, or was it? Uh, how did this? How does it was the same group. We we yeah. were basically what was the name of the group it was again? it was uh, it was Gene, myself, and uh, Phil Mancini was the drummer, and we picked up uh, bass players who might happen to be hitchhiking along the road. That's that's how we wound <laughs> up with bass players. But it was Phil, Gene, and me. But the name of the group was uh, Gene Cornish and the Satellites. And then it was the Nobles. And um, what other what Gene, other Gene names, Cornish Gene? and the Satellites. That, that, that's that, 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 that's that, interesting. That, that's, that's very... I, I, oh, sure. It was I a had... Sputnik. Time of Sputnik. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I get we were, that. We were in 1959. With some magazine voted us a group of the year. Spotlight Magazine. So, uh, yeah. so Gene, as opposed to the Rascals, so you were the leader of the group then? Uh, I guess he would call me that. He I wore a different know. color jacket, so he was the leader. Well, that's yeah. before that's before the Knickers, I know. <laughs> no. we I, got, buy... I, got, I got the gigs. That's before the Knickers. Oh, well, before we'll, the we'll, Knickers. Talk about the, we'll talk about the Knickers later. We used to buy our, our uniforms at Beansy's on Front Street. We, now, also, we also used to have them shipped in from Canal Street. Saxony clothes That's and right. pound craft. Yeah, the tuxedos. We, these, we now, had about six, seven different color plaid tuxedos. Now back and then, so, you, back then you had to pretty much dress up, even if you were a rock and roll band, right? Oh, you had to wear a tie oh. or something. That's that's how that's how, that's how you got to the knickers. Yeah, right? it was tuxedos. Yeah. But, yeah. Now we got with tuxedos with the cummerbund, tuxedo pants, patent leather shoes, bow tie. Yeah, we had. <laughs> We had arguments once in a while about the bow tie because I insisted that we be professional and look professional. And once in a while, there would be a little bit of re rebelness from Phil Mancini. We had a green, mint green tuxedo, jacket and pants with frilly white shirt and a butterfly bow tie. If we didn't look silly, it, it's hard to conceive of that now, you know. And, the, and you think, you know, I, what I say about the Beatles is the Beatles uh, had their had their style. All it was is you had to cut your hair less, and all of a sudden you had a style, right? Um, well, go ahead. Yeah, no, you and I. I don't think that, uh, especially younger people, can conceive of rock and roll back then because rock and roll was looked at as being like evil, right? I mean, it, you, well, oh, you, you're not you, you're not a rock and roller, are you? Right? No. Well, rock and roll rock and roll was based around uh, criminals. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> but, kind of... but not not really not really criminals, but outside the society a little bit, you know, like. Uh, you look at Gene Vincent, you know, Elvis Presley, you know, with the sideburns. They were, they, were, they were always the ones that stood out as anti-society at the time. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember that time. I remember uh, somebody coming up to me at a shoe store or something. My parents would buy me shoes. And, you don't listen to rock and roll, do you? <laughs> <laughs> no, we kind of yeah we're, yeah, we're that old. So um, with that, uh, we are going to uh, head into a break, and we're going to talk more about the old days when we get back. 
Well, welcome back. You're listening to the No Nonsense Roundtable, and we are with uh, a nationally known uh, musical artist, who's uh, uh, Gene Cornish of uh, uh, the Rascals, and uh, his, uh, I would say, well, we'll call you one of his best buds, uh, uh, Pat Prieti, and uh, both Rochester guys, and we're talking about the old days in Rochester and the clubs and the and uh, and the performances and uh, let, let's talk about you, the the two year relationship. I mean, this has been a long time. You kept uh, you kept uh, well. You talk to each other like every week, right? Mm-hmm. Which, yes, which is great. Even though even though Gene's not in the in the area, let's say that. Well, the goal back then for us, we went from playing kids dances and to move up to the four fourteen club was a big deal because you had to be pretty good. Mm-hmm. to uh, fill that place. And we used to play there, what, Gene, six nights a week? Well, we, we would we, we would work sometimes weekends there during the wintertime. But in the summer, uh, I would uh, I would uh, negotiate with Natty Galasano. What was the other guy's name, Ralph? Benny Cagliatore. <laughs> yeah. We, I would negotiate for four weeks straight, six nights a week, four, four sets a night. And, Nine to two, five sets. Nine to two a.m. And uh, yeah, you had to be on the ball because we had some great, great bands come through there. Uh, the, the, the we learned depth. a lot from them. Oh, we, we learned we a lot. We we, we learned, learned about uh, demeanor, about dressing, about yeah. uh, being professional, about putting on uh, an entertaining show as opposed to just music. Mm-hmm. Uh, the groups that he had coming through there from New York and Philadelphia were just amazing. You're you're, yeah, heading, like, you're 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 heading on something that I've heard from from other uh, musical artists is is the, word, is the word entertainment you know rather than just playing the music is engaging the audience. Yeah. Well, we we, we were a little, a little a little in above our heads with some of the humor they had, but you know, they they were entertaining. There was a group called the Jets, which had a guitar player from. Uh, Rochester, New York, who was originally with Frank DeRosa and the Demon, and they had a, a national hit called Big Guitar. And then he moved to uh, he moved to the Frontier in, in um, Vegas, and they would come in once a year. And, boy, they were a big draw, and we would be there as many nights as possible. Uh, I was underage, um, so my dad would take us to go see them. And then, you know, we'd... we'd, we'd, we'd there was local heroes we had. That yep. would, uh, we, we had uh, Frank DeRosa and the G-Men, uh, Chuck Alamo, which was saxophone, had Leapfrog. There was a saxophone player called Bobby Savoy, who they called the Beagle. And we, we'd go watch them at the North Park restaurant on Norton Street also. So so let, let's kind of fast forward a little bit to the uh you know to the uh, you want to call it a big bang or whatever it is you know how how did the rascals get to be the rascals i mean how, how did you guys get mm. together i mean you uh, it's just extraordinarily extraordinary talent with the four of you guys and it's, it was well, just had, it was I just had, four right i mean yeah i had a band from rochester called the unbeatables and uh, we had a song called i want to be a beetle and we sold like thirty thousand copies and albums in Puerto Rico, I went to Puerto Rico and toured, sold out the baseball stadium, et cetera, et cetera. We, we did really well there. Uh, Johnny Baker, Bob Guglamino, and David Hawks and myself. And uh, we came back to Rochester, played at the War Memorial, uh, opening up for Peter and Gordon with WBBF, which was a big deal for us at the time. And then we went to New York and got the job at the Peppermint Lounge and played there where they had the Peppermint Twist with Joey Dean and Starlighters. And if we played there for about six weeks and then they, were, they turned over with the bands and we were out of work for about two weeks and then we got a job at Joey D's club, Joey D from the Starlighters at a club around the corner. And we worked there for about three or four weeks and then guys in the band were missing their girlfriends and blah, blah, blah. And... I wasn't missing anything. I was staying. So we broke up the band, and I joined Joey D and the Starletters. In that band was Felix Cavalieri, was Eddie Bergotti taking uh, his brother David's place, and uh, there was drummer Ricky Shannon and myself. And we would play at the, at, the, at the Joey D's club for a while 
until we had a, a, a disagreement about finances. And Felix said to me, let's start our own band. And I wasn't sure I wanted to do that. I thought I might want to go home to Rochester for a couple of weeks. But then I was told by a current girlfriend at the time, you better not do that. You're going to make a mistake. You're going to wind up there. So I stayed and I joined Felix, Eddie, and a drummer named Dino Donnelly. And we rehearsed uh, four days and learned 26 songs and got ready to play a place called the Choo Choo Club. And uh, we didn't know what to wear. We were having a discussion, and Eddie Brigatti walked in. He was the joker. He was the harpo of the group, and he was wearing these knickers. I went, where the hell did you get them? He said, well, I bought, we bought every pair of knickers they had down on Orchard Street, he said, me and my friends in, in the town, and we didn't even try them on. We just bought them all. They were 50 cents a pair. So we had 26 pair. We said, okay, that looks good. We'll wear knickers, and, and Eddie had a friend who made shirts, he was a shirt maker, and he made the, the little round collar, little Lord Fauntleroy collars. We had knee socks, and we had little ties, and basically it was the Rascals, but we weren't the Rascals yet. We were called Them. I came up with the, with the name Them, and about three weeks after using the name, Van Morrison came out with them, so that killed that. And Dino, Dino Donnelly was an insomnia, insomniac, and we would get home at four in the morning and he would watch the little rascals. And he came in one day and said, Got ourselves, call ourselves the rascals. You gotta be kidding. That sounds like a circus <laughs> act from Vegas. So anyway, so he put these little fortune cookie papers in our shoes and a dressing room, on our shirts, on the microphones, everywhere. We finally gave in and we called it the rascals. <laughs> I, you know, I'm a little bit of a marketing guy, and I, I love this story because it's 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 innovative. But I, I like the way you worded that. We finally gave in. <laughs> it was like oh, we, we couldn't we take to, it we, anymore. No, we couldn't take yeah. it anymore. But yeah. but well, we called ourselves the Rascals. Yeah, and we got the we got the record deal at the Barge in the Hamptons. Yep. We got a manager, Sid Bernstein, who was yep. a promoter of Shea Stadium with the Beatles. And when our first record came out, I ain't got to eat in my heart anymore. We got copies at the hotel we were yeah. staying. We looked at the label and said, they're young rascals. Yeah. Oh, we were mortified because, you know, that's not exactly. We considered ourselves an R&B yeah. band. Yeah. We're, we're too cool for young. Yeah. But we, thought, we were told that they had to put that in because the group called the Harmonica Rascals, which were, well, I'm dating myself now, but which were in the 50s and early 60s on the Ed Sullivan show was Johnny Palio and the Harmonica Rascals. And they sent a letter of cease and desist, here's the name. <laughs> That's why we got the word young in front. You got, got young out of there. We're, we're, uh, we're about ready to head into a, a hard news break, but uh, th th this whole story is fascinating because it was a chemical reaction that happened with, uh, with the four of you because you both had, you, you all had very unique talents and uh, uh, it, it worked. And uh, I want to talk about uh, when we come back, uh, Shea Stadium, when, uh, when the news break is over, Gene. I'm sure you have uh, lots of memories about that deal. So uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be right back after this. Well, welcome back. You're listening to No Nonsense Roundtable. We're here with uh, Gene Cornish, a famous inductee of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He's going to be here on uh, September 26th because we are honoring him at uh, the uh, Frontier Field. The Red Wings are hosting uh, Gene uh, for an appearance and uh, is going to be Gene Cornish Day in appreciation for the attention that you've given to Rochester and uh, uh, the fact that uh, you're like one of the honored sons of Rochester, Gene. So we're looking forward to seeing you there. Hi, look, look, I grew up a block away from Red Wing Stadium. So I'm a, uh, I moved to New York 55 years ago, became a Yankee fan. But I'm a lifelong Rochester Red Wing fan. Yeah, and uh, uh, just to let everybody know, um, we are going to be selling a few tickets for a luxury suite, and the uh, profits from that are going to go to the uh, Rotary uh, Sunshine Camp. And if you go to uh, rochesterrotary.com, you can uh, find out about the tickets. But uh, it's September 26th. It's a game at 6 o'clock. And uh, I, I know you're going to have a lot of your friends there. And uh, I, I think it's going to be a, a great 
a, a great time, and we're going to be honored to see you up here. Well, I'm glad that you're selling some tickets for the for that uh, benefit. You know, I, I, I uh, Pat and I played ten years in a row at the House of Guitars to benefit uh, the homeless mm -hmm. with uh, food and clothing. So the House of Guitars is my home in Rochester at this time. And I need to mention that. And you're going to bring some of your books. You're going to sign some books for us, right? Yeah, I'll have, I will have some books. And my uh, co-writer Stephen Miller will be with me. And and we'll we'll we'll, we'll yeah we'll, we'll we'll pass around the love. Yeah, and uh, again, the name of the book is Good Loving, and uh, you can buy one on September 26, or go to Amazon and get the book, which is uh, where I got my book a, a few months ago. And and there's some very fascinating stories in there. And one of my favorite stories is uh, is Shea Stadium. The Beatles are playing Shea Stadium, and, and uh, t t tell us about that whole deal about being there. Well, we had signed with Sid Bernstein in July of 65 at the Barge. And then we got our Atlantic Records contract through him. And on August 15th, he, he, was, uh, he was already promoting the Beatles at Trey Stadium. There's a big rumor that we opened for them. We did not. We were just in, we were in attendance. It was our day off. We, we sat in the, in the visitor's dugout. And, and the Beatles came out right past us, within like three inches of us, ran fast, so fast, and uh, you couldn't hear, you couldn't hear a note. They had over a hundred speakers. At the time, 1965, there weren't these massive PA systems. So they had these Vox columns, uh, which was like every five feet, and you couldn't hear a thing, it was like, sitting behind a jet engine on, at the airport. <laughs> yeah, I, I heard that. I heard the screaming was so loud. It, oh, it's that so loud. You couldn't hear the music loud. at all. Yeah. They couldn't hear, and they didn't have monitors to begin with. One of the reasons why a couple of years later they just quit. They well, just gave up. Well, on the scoreboard, somebody put uh, coming up next, uh, the Rascals or something? Uh, uh, Sid Bernstein, the promoter, had... On, on the Jumbotron before the Beatles came on, the Rascals are coming. Well, Brian Epstein, the manager, had a fit. <laughs> he said, if you don't take that down, I'm not going to let the Beatles play. <laughs> Can you imagine not letting the Beatles play for 55,000 people? So wow. Sid took it down. Uh, later on, about six months later, uh, we became friends. Well, he was friends. Sid was friends with Brian Epstein, the Beatles manager. We be, we became friends, and he came to the recording studio because we were going to record. We invited him. We were going to record a cover song of No Reply by the Beatles, uh -huh. uh, which didn't work out recording-wise, but he became a fan. Well, I think a lot of people don't realize uh, how many hits you had. I mean, you uh, now the Beatles preceded you by just a little bit, but you, you, you were. I mean, the the music of the Rascals was was right up there. I mean, how many? Well, you know, we were blessed with seventeen hit singles in a row. Seventeen hit singles in a row. Eight alb eight gold albums in a row in a five year period, and the record company said we were lazy. <laughs> Said you were lazy, but I think one of the things was you—you you had a, it was with Atlantic Records, right? Yes, it was. We signed with Atlantic Records because all the other labels wanted us, but Atlantic said if you come with us, we can move from R and B and jazz into rock and roll. And we're with you and our, and they said, and we'll give you free studio time in our studio, which was the only eight-track studio in the world. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't understand how how important that eight track was. I, I know there was a story. well, every Beatles were did Beatles only had they had all the money in the world. All they had was four tracks, but Atlantic had the eight track five years before we got there, designed by Les Paul. Mm. Well, who I, designed I, guitars. Well, I think a lot of people don't understand that back. You know, the the big innovation was from from mono to stereo, and and when you when you start morphing into that, I mean, then then you're talking about a much well, more you sophisticated could add process. Things, you, you, could, you could separate. You could add the drums on one track, the piano on one track, guitar on one track, vocals on tracks, and if you had horns and strings or whatever, you had flexibility. The luxury was amazing.
Well, uh, you know, and you all have your own talents. I mean, I mean, if you watch Dino with with his drums and and even the antics he does with his with his hands and whatever, I mean, it was it was it was an artful performance. Um, oh, amazing! Amazing. Yeah. It, you know, Eddie's Eddie's you know vocals were fantastic. I mean, I, I mean, you have you have Felix. He's playing this 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 damn organ the size of a lifeboat. For God's sakes! I mean, it, well, it was Hammond B three Hammond B three organ was basically a church organ. A gospel organ and then it was built for that and then it was used by jazz players like jimmy jimmy smith jimmy jack mcduff all uh, all the great jazz players and that's where felix picked up on it yeah and it, felix, felix also played the bass pedals so we didn't you know, use the bass player live yeah it, it it's 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 extraordinary <laughs> it said it said i guess more roadies have broken their back from that b3 than anything oh let me tell you something roadies hated us <laughs> <laughs> but 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 let's now let's talk about you your guitar playing and the riffs that you that you did uh are, are legendary i mean you have a, a well, thank you you're very kind well, well no it's know, just a fact i uh I grew up on 4th Fort Geneva Street learning my craft up on the second floor apartment above my father's bait and tackle store. And uh, basically, I learned my craft in the, in the bedroom there and learned, used to play Dwayne, Pat and I used to play Dwayne Eddy songs, Rebel Rouser. Yeah. Gro moving and grooving. But we used to play uh, Bill Doggett, Honky Tonk. We, we did a lot of instrumental work also. Yeah, and, and and you know, I I know people like you in the in the business. You, you the the money can be good, but you're really not doing it for the money. You're doing it because you just love to do it. And that was nah, I'm doing it for the money. Don't pay <laughs> <it. laughs> no, Oh, no. I love it. that's no, the no, first no, time. Let me tell you, you know, your your honest your your honesty is legendary. Uh, you know, first of all, not it wasn't just the money; it was the girls. <laughs> okay, but, but you know what? When you see, I mom and I and dad. From 1957, 58, watched the Ed Sullivan show every Sunday. Uh -huh. And uh, would watch it religiously. Buddy Holly, Elvis Presley, Everly Brothers, uh, this one, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis. And uh, one time, Mom, uh, Dad took us, took Mom and I, and I think Pat was with us. We were in, in New York City. I was doing an audition at a, at a some rehearsal studio which my dad knew nothing was going to come of it, but it was still experience for us. And we're walking down Broadway and walking by Jack Dempsey's restaurant, and out comes Ed Sullivan. Well, my mother, you, you know, no filter. My mother ran up to him. He said, you don't know who I am, but my son is going to be on your show someday. Great story. Well, we're heading into another break, and we're going to talk more about, uh, well, the progress of the group right after this. Well, welcome back. You're listening to No Nonsense Roundtable. We're here with uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee Gene Cornish, who's going to be here on September 26th at uh, Red Wings game for uh, Gene Cornish Day. And uh, uh, his uh, best bud, Pat Prietti, uh, is sitting across the desk from me here. Uh, let, me, let me just say two words to you, and uh, you comment on this. Steve Van Zandt. That's three words. <laughs> oh, Van Zandt, his, his last name is one. Well, first of all, very grateful for the show that he put together with us, Once Upon a Dream. We were on Broadway for three weeks, Toronto for two weeks. Uh, I even played the, the, the Auditorium Theater in Rochester. We sold out the Auditorium Theater, which is the theater that I saw my very first rock and roll show. My mom had taken me to see the... The Everly Brothers. It was, it was one of those shows that had 10, 12 acts. Bo Diddley, Paul Lanka, Buddy Holly, Dwayne Eddy, uh, Little Anthony and the Imperials, and so so. And I uh, went to see them. I, we went to see the afternoon matinee show. And uh, I looked at Mom and I said, you know, this is... Uh, uh, the, the, the Everly Brothers just mesmerized me in, the, in their performance. And I said, Mom... This is what I want to be for the rest of my life. Mm. I was no more than 13 years old, 14 years old. I said, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I don't want to go to Columbia University. I want to go to Columbia Records. I told her, I promised her right then that I would someday play the Auditorium Theater, headline the Auditorium Theater. 
someday in the future and that I would buy her a Cadillac and a house with a swimming pool. And so when we got to Rochester, uh, we didn't talk much in Once Upon a Dream. We just did the music. But at one point I got on the mic and I said, I told him the story about a young man, a young aspiring guitar player who sat in the top row in the balcony overlooking this stage. I said, and he told his mother he was going to buy her a house and a Cadillac, and he was going to headline this show for her. I said, and here, she, and here I am doing it. It happens to be her birthday. So it, 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 the, the audience went wild. Uh, that it, 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 It's a wonderful story. If anybody wants to see... Um the induction ceremony for uh, the Rascals, uh, you can get on YouTube. And Stevie Van Zandt's uh, introduction of you guys, I mean, is, is just absolutely hilarious. Well, he did a great job. You know, he, he was on the board of directors in the Hall of Fame. We were nominated eight years in a row and did not get inducted. He fought for us with a guy named Lenny Kay, who plays guitar with Patti Smith. And they lobbied for us. They finally got us in there. And, and they wanted to... Uh, Bruce Springsteen, Billy Joel, or Phil Spector to induct us, and I fought for Stevie to induct us because he deserves it. And we, yeah, you know, I also, I also got inducted in the Rochester Hall of Fame, and Pat Bryady inducted me, and inducted me, and inducted me. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 Pat, I, 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 Pat, I think he's trying to tell you something. He, 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 he spoke so brilliantly and without any notes and the first time he ever told me after he did that he told me he was scared because he never he was never nervous but he was nervous because everybody had notes and he didn't tell him pat what happened we sat through eight people going and chuck mangione was one of them and i was sitting in the front row with barbara and i said i, I think i'm in trouble they're all coming out here with uh, papers that they're reading and I don't have any notes. I just have stories. Uh -huh. And when I was backstage, Doug Emlidge said to me, you're up. Where are your notes? I said, I don't have any notes. And <laughs> he said, how are you going to do it? Well, I went out there and I told the first joke that I told, first funny story. I heard the audience laugh. And that was it. I was a witch on wheels after that. Oh, man, uh, forget and, about it. They could, They tried to give him the hook. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce told me I had, Bruce Pilato said I had four minutes. I went six minutes into it, and Felix was standing behind me. And he grabbed me, <laughs> he grabbed me from behind and told me I was all through. And that was it. Felix wow. Cavalieri grabbed you and told him. Yeah. So, so a oh. member of the group actually yank you off the stage yep. because well, you were spending too much money so much too much time on the group they were concerned if they went <laughs> past 11 o'clock ah. at the eastman they had to pay the help double time union ah, yeah okay. it was a union so bruce yeah. told me i had four minutes when i got to six minutes he sent felix out to get me so it was <laughs> the really girl funny. next to me standing who was doing the signing it was me and felix right behind me with his phone in his hand and he grabbed me and pulled me off yeah, yeah. That's uh, I, rem I, I remember that uh, Tracy Croft, who was on the board of directors for the Hall of Fame, also tried to get Pat off. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was a memorable night. It was it was a lot of fun. So, Gene, we we have uh, only a couple of minutes left. I think we have about three minutes left. I, you know, one of the questions I ask people uh, sometimes. I mean, look back on your career and uh, and. and the, the whole journey that you've taken you know what what do you what are you the most proud of and you can't you can't talk about your family this is the rule of the no nonsense round table you can't talk about your you know your, your your kids your relatives what are you most proud of well i don't care what your rules are the most happiest greatest <laughs> moments the greatest moments when Atla when uh murray the k convinced atlantic records to put out groove and they didn't want to put it out because there was no organ there was no drums there was no guitar on the record and it went to number one. And number one, when it became number one, it allowed me to buy a house for my mom and dad. Wow, that's a great that's a great story. It's somebody believing in you when everybody else didn't believe in you. And whether it's Murray the K or you know one of your relatives, I mean that's a that's a that's a great story. Pat, um, well, my mom and my mom and dad were the greatest supporters ever. They gave up everything for me. We we 
we were very very blue collar. Had a ma- had a bait shop, a bait and tackle and hunting equipment. But I always had a tuxedos. I always had Pat leather shoes, equipment, guitar, amplifier, and Pat will tell you, well, I had the greatest parents ever. And yeah, no question. And, and a tremendous love of Rochester. Yeah. Oh my God! Let me tell you, uh, my ties are very strong at Rochester. Going, going to the House of Guitars. Talking to Pat at least twice a week, asking how the Rochester Red Wings are doing, how's the weather, blah blah blah, everything you know. Uh, going to going to Whitey Priety's restaurant. Uh, gotta go to Don and Bob's. I wonder what ever happened to Bob. Now it's just called Don's. Don's original. So um, I'll do a little retail one more time. It's September 26th. It's going to be Gene Cornish Day at. Uh, uh, Red Wings game, and the uh, game starts at 6 o'clock. We're going to have some tickets for sale. Um, the Rochester Rotary is going to be selling the ones for the luxury suite. You're going to be signing books down in the, the Breezeway, regardless if uh, you have a ticket for the luxury suite or not. And uh, I know there's going to be an awful lot of people who are just going to want to come see you just because you are who you are. And, uh, and, and Rochester loves you, and you love Rochester, I know. And uh, thank you for coming mm-hmm. on the show. It's been an honor to have you, you know, here, and I look forward to meeting you in person. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to the day that Naomi Silver and Dan Mason have put together for me, and you also. Pat will be there right next to me sharing sharing this honor, and I appreciate it. Looking forward. God bless, God bless Rochester. God bless our troops. Absolutely. I, I like to mirror those words. And, and, and Pat, I guess we're, we're not going to have you on stage unless it's four minutes and less, right? <laughs> Pat, will, Pat will be with me on stage right next to me. <laughs> bring a stopwatch. <laughs> we'll bring the stopwatch. Okay, everybody, thanks for listening. See you next Saturday, 10 to 11 on News Radio AM 1180. Well, thanks for watching this YouTube. If you liked it, please like and share.